All right, so th thank you guys for letting me talk. I'm thrilled to talk about medical missions. I feel a little bit like I'm preaching to the choir, but I think that medical missions are just a terrific way to express our faith um, to the world. So the goal of my talk is um, fourfold. I'd like to show what the Orthodox Church is doing worldwide to address the physical needs of its people. I want to show how medical missions are part of the evangelical um, goal of the Orthodox Church worldwide. I want to talk a little bit about how medical missions have evolved over the time that I've been involved with them. And I'd like to excite people about the opportunities and the challenges of medical missions. Why am I excited about medical missions? First of all, as a physician. Um, I decided to go back to medical school late. I was 39 when I started medical school. And so for me to go to medical school, I had to have the support of a lot of people. Um, the first picture is uh, my graduation. Um, I was The Medical College of Georgia is very open to older students, so I was really lucky to be able to go to the Medical College of Georgia. On the right is my picture with my father. He's since passed away. But my parents and my family were very supportive of me going back to um, medical school. And there are many countries in the world where I could not have done that, where I could not have gone back to medical school as an older person. And so I, I was very privileged to be able to live in America when I decided to go back to medical school. When I was young, I really wanted to be a doctor. Um, it didn't work out. So again, a real privilege to be able to do that. As an Orthodox Christian, my journey to orthodoxy, there's James right there. Um, my journey to orthodoxy was uh, not straight. Um, I was raised as a Protestant. I went to a Protestant college. Um, I really did want to be a, um, a, a medical missionary was when I was in college. But life has a way of uh, pointing us in a different direction. So I ended up marrying, having kids. And um, my husband, um, that I, when I got married in college, he decided that he wanted to um, explore. He didn't feel like the free Methodist faith was the right faith for him. And so he wanted to look for the, the right church. And so we, after a journey, he finally found Orthodoxy. And his wife, I converted along with him. We converted into the Antiochian Orthodox Church. And he actually went on to become a priest. He went to Holy Cross. So this was a while ago. And so for many years, I was a huri. And I was Orthodox because that's what he was. And at some point, that marriage fell apart. And so I was faced with a decision. And my decision was, was Orthodoxy my faith, or was it just the faith that I took on because that's what my husband did? And so at that point, I decided that Orthodoxy was my faith. And so I embraced it um, in a way that I hadn't before, even though I had been very involved with the church. So that was a real important part of my going um, into medical missions because it that's, that was how it became my faith. These are, these are some pictures from uh, Uganda, I mean from Tanzania. And as an American, we as Americans have so much. And um, even the poorest American has more than the Africans. Um, on the left, we have an Orthodox, I mean, an African toilet. And so you can see that um, they put the bricks there so you'd have, you know, raise your feet so <laughs> it was sanitary. And on the right, we have a, um, an African kitchen. So the Africans have so little, and we have so much. And so as, an, as Orthodox, um, we have a lot that we are being asked to give, you know, of whom much is given, much is expected. So as an American, I really feel that we do have, we are called to give back um, in a way um, that sometimes we forget about. So what's a medical mission all about? How does it happen? You first start, you fill out an application. Um, every year, the OCMC, which is the or um, Orthodox Christian Mission Center, um, puts list, um, publishes a list of um, missions for the year, short-term missions. Um, most of them are not medical, but there always are a few medical missions. Um, they have dates, they have costs, and they always talk about um, who they're looking for. In medical missions, of course, we're always looking for caregivers um, as well as nurses and other medical professionals. So you fill out an application and you send it into the mission center. Okay. 
second part is raising money. Once you're accepted to go on a mission, then you, um, that's a very important part of going on a mission is raising money. And that's twofold. One is because many people could not go on a short-term mission if they had to pay for it themselves. So this allows a lot of people to go on missions. But the second part is it involves the community in your mission. Um, it's very important that when you go on a mission that you have a lot of people back home praying for you. They're your prayer warriors while you're on the mission. And then also they're your audience when you come back and talk about the mission. So raising money is an important part. Now as a physician, I have a higher salary than probably most of the people in my parish, especially since we have a lot of retirees. So I particularly, I personally don't feel comfortable asking for money for my mission, but I do want to get my church involved. So this last time before I went, um, we had a, a, the Sunday school sponsored a drive for things for us to take. Um, the Indonesia mission had um, schools. So we raised, we had um, school supplies, let's see, we had school supplies, we raised, um, they donated some clothes, we had some icons, we donated vitamins, and just things that I could take. So my parish felt like they were a part of my mission. And then the next part is learning about our new country. This is a map and you can see the string that goes from Fort Myers, Florida to Medan, Indonesia over here. So before you even um, go on your mission, the OCMC sends you information about your country. Um, they send you information about the Orthodox Church in your country. They send you information about the medical, condi the medical conditions in your country. They send you information about the population, about how the wealth is distributed, about the religion. So you start to learn about where you're going. And then the final step is preparation. All short-term or most short-term missions start with um, meeting at the mission center. This is the Mission Center in St. Augustine, Florida. It's a beautiful building. Um, the, over, over here on the right are the classrooms, and that's where we stay while we're being oriented. And on the left are the offices of the Mission Center. So we all meet at the Mission Center uh, about usually one or two days before we go on the mission. That first step is to meet our team. Most often teams are from all over the United States, and most of us do not know each other before we come together. And we're all going together to a foreign country um, to do a, a job. And so it's really important that before we go, we get to know each other and we feel like a cohesive unit. Teams come in all shapes and sizes. Um, this team is my team to Indonesia, and there were five of us. A team on the right is my team to uh, Tanzania, and it was a very big team. So teams can be big or small. They can have young and old, they can have male and female. So teams are always very eclectic and a big part of the mission is getting to know these people and um, working together. Next step is to learn about the OCMC. What does the OCMC do? Um, this is Deacon James and Margot. They're in charge of long-term missions. And the reason we want to learn about long-term missions is part of the goal of the OCMC is to excite people about missions. And a lot of times people on short-term missions decide they want to go back for a longer term. Um, I have worked with people um, on short-term missions that have become long-term missionaries. Daphne's sitting here in the audience. So it's, 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 sometimes it's a journey. Now, most people that go on short-term missions don't become long-term missionaries. But it's, a, it's always good for us to know what long-term missionaries are in the field, so we as a, a team can also pray for them. And then we get together. Um, the short-term mission coordinators here are Andy Likos um, and Presbytero Renee. And we spend some time talking about um, getting to know each other. They have some getting to know each other um, exercises, getting to know about, more about our country, and talking more about, the, in our cases, the medicine, the medical part of the mission. So here we are um, talking um, before the mission. The last mission I went on um, was extra special at the, at the mission center because the board was meeting. They don't usually like to have the board meet at the same time that a mission team is getting ready to go out because there's a lot going on. But for some reason, communication got confused, so the board met at the mission center. So we were actually able to meet the board, and the board, all these men and women are, are the 
heart and brains behind the OCMC. There, there are what makes um, the short-term missions possible. So it was a real privilege for me to meet the mem some of the members of the board, and that's where I met Dr. John and Gail, and um, it was really a privilege to, to know who was making all these things possible for us. Travel. The thing that people always ask me about um, short-term missions is, oh, man, that's a long way to go. And most of the missions I've been on have been a long ways away. But missions, you don't have to go a long ways to go on a, on a mission. Um, that we have medical missions to Guatemala. We have non-medical missions to Alaska and Mexico. So you can go on a mission, on a, a particularly a medical mission, um, and you don't have to go a long ways away. But if you do, you just have to enjoy the trip. Always lots of luggage. Um, we always take much more luggage on the way out because we're almost always taking things to um, the, the people that we're going to visit. So uh, the, this car on the left was our mission, all the luggage we had for the five people that went to Indonesia. The picture on the right is Tanzania, and with all the people, we just had myriads of luggage. Now, on the way back, we usually have half a suitcase because if we, we give everything away that we brought for them, plus we give most of the clothes away that we brought. So we come back with very little. And here we are just enjoying the ride. This picture here is in Kuala Lumpur. Um, we we're about halfway through our trip to Medan, Indonesia, and we found a Starbucks. So we we're very excited to have a cup of coffee. And then sometimes we catch a nap between flights. When we went to Tanzania, the, when I went to Tanzania the first time, we had an eight-hour layover in Amsterdam. So we decided that we were going to just take advantage of it, even though we were pretty tired. So we got on the train. We went to visit a cheese shop. We tried out a bicycle. And we also were able to visit the Anne Frank Museum, which was a very sobering experience. So we have fun on missions also. So what are the challenges of a medical mission? Medical mission has probably um, a few more challenges than um, a regular um, short-term mission. First of all is the window of opportunity. For a medical mission, you have a sp specific window of time. And as we all know, you know, people may or may not get sick in a specific window of time. So we're going to try to treat people from these certain dates and so our, we're trying to maximize our medical effectiveness. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then the second is treatment versus teaching. You know, we all know the saying, give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. So when we go on a medical mission, is it just our job to see some sick people and get them better and then go back to the United States? Or is it our job to try to leave something behind? And so we are working towards trying to teach the, on, on the caregivers that are in, already in the field so that our job is not just to, to treat sick people but to also give more tools to the caregivers that we are leaving behind. Oh, and then the third is, do you go to the people or do you have the people come to you? And we've had, I've been on missions that we've done it both ways and I'll talk about the pros and cons of each one. First mission I went on, first medical mission I went on was in 2010 to Gulu. We, they had been the year before, so they knew some of, the, some of the pitfalls, but we were still trying to figure it out. This was, um, this is Father Joseph. This is the only um, mission trip that I went on that we ever had a priest on it. And that really made a nice difference. Uh, I wish more priests would go on medical missions. They, they may think that they don't have medical training, but so often um, the priest's job like we talked about, the chaplain's job is to, to support the, the people in the field while we're doing the medical part. This is our team. We didn't have any men on that team except Father Joseph. In our Gulu mission, we started in Kampala. Um, this is the compound in Kampala where um, Bishop Jonah lives. And so we spent the first night there, got our medicines together, and... Um, got ready to go back uh, out to Gulu, which is in North Uganda. 
And in, the, um, in Kampala, they do have a seminary. So Father Joseph was able to meet with the seminarians and do a little bit of teaching. The child, this was a, a mission where we went to the people. So we went to the villages where they had Orthodox churches. And we had to kind of figure out how to set up a, a clinic. And um, Dr. Jenkins kind of alluded to that when he, when he was um, in uh, Afghanistan, is that you have to figure out how to just use what is available. And he had, I, I, I laughed because he had a similar thing. We had shoe bags that we put our medicines in. I think they had a similar setup. So we set up our shoe bags. We, we, brought all, we bring all of our medicines with us when we go. And we have to set up our pharmacy and our tables and um, get ready. Sometimes uh, this one on the left, we were um, in a church or in a building. Um, sometimes we're just out in the open and they just put tarps to keep the sun off of us. So how to make order out of chaos. When you arrive in a village, this is often what you're greeted by. Just a mass of, of Africans very anxious to see the American doctors. And so the first couple clinics are sometimes quite challenging because we're trying to figure out how to find the people that are really sick because a lot of people that are there are not. So we sort of figured it out. Um, we always had a native doctor with us um, on the mission, the mission trip, the mission trips, because um, they can help us with the native diseases. So that's always valuable. Um, on the right here is Sue Nelson, um, and you'll hear more about her later. She's um, a, a missionary. Um, she's not a missionary. She's a, a nurse or a nurse practitioner that um, has a real place in her heart for Uganda, has and has done a lot for Uganda um, since I was with her on this trip. Here's just another picture of her. So like I said, we sort of figured it out, but we still, this is a, a group of, of people all waiting for their prescriptions. So we hadn't quite figured out how to make the pharmacy keep up with um, us seeing patients. So we had a big backup of, of the pharmacy. And here you'll see um, these are two of our team members and at the end, the, the problem with a medical mission in, well, in the field is that you have no lights. You're going out to the village and there's no lights. And in, in Africa, it's, it's real near the equator, so it gets dark like at 7 o'clock. So you really have to have clinic done by 7. So what we do is we kind of reevaluate things about 4 or 5 and figure out how much we have left, how many people we have left to see, and what we can do. So what we had to do a lot of times is, is we had big crowds left, and so we just had to kind of line them up and hand out Tylenol or Pepsid, whether they had back aches, we got Tylenol, if they had stomach aches, they got Pepsid. It was not an ideal way to practice medicine, and we were all really frustrated at the end of, of clinics like that. Orthodoxy has, I mean, Uganda has a very vibrant Orthodox church, and that's, of course, part of any uh, medical clinic is, is the, the, the faith. And this is Father George with his kids. And he, again, I'll, I'll talk more about him later when I talk about the new clinic in his village. And again, Father Joseph was able, um, when he knew he was coming, he got donations from a lot of priests. And so he brought um, new vestments for the, a lot of the local priests. So this is the local priests modeling their new vestments um, that were a gift from Father George, I mean from Father Joseph. 2011 um, Tanzania trip was a unique um, trip because we had four long-term missionaries on the ground preparing for us. So Maria Rober, James Hargrave, Felice Stewart, and Michael Pagatis. And they had been there about a year, I think, when we got there. And so they, when we arrived there, they really had things organized. So that was uh, one of our more e efficient um, medical missions. But also we suffered some of the same frustrations that we did in Uganda. We had a very ambitious agenda. Uh, we landed in Mwanza, and then we had um, three or four uh, clinics in, in various uh, churches in Magu, and three or four clinics in various churches in Gita. Because it was a big group, we had a big bus, so every, every day we would pile into the bus in the morning, and you, you can see us here in the bus. And sometimes time on the bus is, is, your, is your 
most precious time. That's when you guys have, that's when we have time to, we always had prayers in the morning. Um, different mission trips have different ways. Um, we, we had different ways of how we would um, worship. Um, we did our own prayers here. Um, sometimes we would have services at the church when we got there, but this was our prayers to get us ready. And then we always talked about the day and what we were going to do. When you go to the people, you have to bring the medicines. So a big part of the mission trips where you go out into the field was packing the medicines. When we got to the country, we'd buy all the medicines locally. Um, we have brought medicines with us, but we try not to do that. There's, um, for many reasons. One is because we want to support the country. Um, so before, before we started the missions, we all sat down and packed up the medicines. So that's, that's a big job. So we all kind of worked together. And then every night after clinic, we would have to go back home, um, back to the hotel, and then repack the medicines for the next day. So that made for very long days. Same kind of thing, big crowds on arrival. And then the first thing we had to do, of course, was set up the clinic. Now, the priest would try to have things set up as much as possible ahead of time, so he would maybe have these tarps, but then we'd have to lay out our pharmacy and set up our tables. So we had some new ideas on the Tanzania trip. So we decided we were going to organize the patients. So we made lines. Africans don't like lines. <laughs> so we put all the men in one line. We put all the women and the children in, in another line and all the older women in an, another line. And while we were organizing the line, um, they were setting up the pharmacy. And pharmacies sometimes were out in the open sun. So what we decided to do is because we knew that when you go to the village, you get a lot of people that come just because they want to see the American doctors. But there's a lot of sick people there, too. So we didn't want to miss taking care of the sick people because of all the other people. It's kind of like, again, Dr. Jenkins was talking about triaging. So we did actually triage. So we had nurses and doctors. Um, this is a nurse, and this is a PA. Um, we would triage, and we would ask every, we would see every patient, talk to them face to face with the translator, of course, and say, you know, why are you here? If it was something that we could take care of in triage, if it was something that required, um, if they had back pain and we wanted to give them Tylenol, we had a lot of people with, um, a lot of kids with uh, capitis, um, fungus capitis on their head, and so we could give them medicines. Um, so we did a lot of that in the triage. And then if it was somebody that either needed some more history or was more complex, then we had two uh, doctors set up that would see the, the patients from the triage. So this gentleman on the right had an abscess on his neck, so Dr. Deitch was able to, to lance the abscess and bandage it. But despite our best efforts, the first day is always the, worst, the hardest day because we're still new. Um, the dark, dark fell and we weren't done. So we all donned our headlamps and we finished filling prescriptions by <laughs> headlamp diet. So as I said, a, a big part of a, every uh, medical mission is the, the Orthodox faith because it's not just about the medicine, it's also about the faith. So whenever possible, we would start the mission by meeting in the church. And these churches were packed. And there is nothing more spiritually uplifting than an entire church full of Africans singing along with the liturgy. It wasn't a liturgy, singing along with the service. Uh, it just fills your heart. It was just really, those were really wonderful experiences. The bishop in Tanzania is Bishop Hieronymus, um, marvelous, amazing man. And he was with us for a lot of this trip, so we really got to know him. This picture here, after um, on Sunday liturgy, um, he got, they brought in boxes of milk and cookies or biscuits, and he sat down on the front porches of the church and handed it out to all the children. And can you imagine one of our bishops doing that? And it was pretty amazing. 
So again, a very charismatic leader, but a really warm and wonderful man. The bishop, the bishop, the mission to Tanzania was very difficult. We, we had long days. We spent a lot of time in the, in the field. We had uh, big crowds. So we were tired. We had a lot, that's the, only, that's the only mission I've been on where we actually had illnesses among the, the workers too. So it was a tough mission. Um, but to kind of reward us for that, um, Michael Pagatis had arranged at the very end, our last day of the mission, to go to the Serengeti. So we were able to have a day on the Serengeti, and that was really amazing. So here are some of the animals we saw while we were on our trip to the Serengeti. In, four, in 2014, I went back to Tanzania, and it was a totally different mission. By then, the long-term missionaries had all left for various reasons. And um, Maria and Felice, when they were um, commissioned to go to Tanzania, their job was to run this clinic, the Ufofo, 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 Ufofo which means Theotokos, a resurrection. A resurrection. Okay. So, um, but unfortunately, when they got there, the clinic had not gotten the required um, authorization from the government to open. So it was not a functioning clinic. So most of their two years was spent getting the authorization for, for the government, from the government instead of actually running the clinic. Now when they left, they had gotten it, but they were only able to spend just a few months with a functioning clinic. So when the, the team that went back to Tanzania in 2014, we were able actually to go to the clinic. And that was the first clinic where the people came to us. So we stayed at the clinic and then the patients came in. And the clinic is a joint venture. Um, it was a joint venture between the long-term missionaries, particularly Maria and Felice. Um, this gentleman in the middle is Yanis from uh, Greece and he, the, the Greece um, had an organization called Kudos. I think it's, I have it later. Kedos? Kedos. Um, and they provided a lot of money to the clinic, and they um, would send Giannis two or three times a year to help get the clinic going. And then, of course, um, the Tanzanian Orthodox Church. So th in this um, mission, we actually stayed in town. There was a, a van that they had to drive us to clinic every day. So every morning we would get in the van. You can see all us here in the back row and then we would pick up all the workers for the clinic. So that made sure they got to work on time. So when we arrived at clinic with all the workers, clinic started. And this was a clinic run by locals. That was really a, a unique part of it compared to the other missions we'd been on. So all the employees were paid for and um, lived locally. They had their own pharmacy. This is their intake window. They paid for, they, paid, they had to pay for their own, um, their appointment. Um, so there was a cost to the patients. Um, sometimes there was a fund that, that for indigent patients. So if they had to, um, they, ha they couldn't pay for the patient. They still were seen from the indigent fund. Um, but that, of course, that fund ran pretty low. We were able to put a little bit more in it while we were there, but they were always saying there was always hard to keep that indigent fund up to where it needed to be. And then they had their own medical records, so this was all run by, all administratively run. And then this was the first medical mission where we worked alongside the native doctors. And before the native doctor was there, but he worked in one place and we worked in another. Here we worked alongside of them. And again, then we were much more able to um, interact with them. And so we were learning about um, native medicine, how they did things, but they, we also taught them. So it was a much better exchange of information. Um, this is um, Sophia, she was a PA student and then, um, I always forget her name. Anyway, she was a nurse. <laughs> And then here's um, 
me. Now, they, this was a medical officer. Um, in Tanzania, they have uh, different levels. Medical officer is equivalent to like a PA. And this is our interpreter. And then here's Giannis working with the business office. We joined their weekly meeting, talking about how the clinic was going and what kind of things that they wanted to do. And in this, most of the time when we were on the road, we had to stay in hotels. But at this medical mission, we actually stayed locally. This was a house that the archdiocese owned, and the, that's where the long-term missionaries lived when they were there. So we were, we were able to stay there. We ate every morning um, breakfast and dinner there. We, they had a cook that came in and, and fixed our meals. And there was a church right next door, which was just wonderful. So kind of like here. So in the morning, the bell would ring. We'd hear the bell. That'd be kind of like our five-minute warning. We'd roll out of bed, put our clothes on, walk over to the church, have morning service, and then come back, have breakfast, go to clinic. And then when we got back from clinic, Father would hold another service, and then we'd go, um, go back to eat and go to bed. So it really made, it, it, it was really like the Tanzania where we got to go to church in the native church. It really starts to integrate the faith with the, the medicine. And here's um, Father Spiridon and his children. And this is, the church was beautiful. They had an um, icon iconographer come from Greece and do the icons. You, I didn't really get a good picture of that, but it was a beautiful church. And also during this um, mission, we got to visit a local family. One of our interpreters, his family lived locally, and they invited us to come over and see their home. They were very gracious. They had, gave, gave us a little meal, and then when they left, right here, they gave us a goat. So I'm like, what are we going to do with the goat? <laughs> but they tied him up. We took, took him back, and then he was, they kept him. While we were there, they just kept him in the back, but I think he probably ended up on the somebody's table eventually. <laughs> but you can see small, small homes, lots of people. And that's incidentally, um, there was just recently a uh, earthquake um, in Tanzania and Bukoba is where it, was, it, where it hit. And I think there was some damage to his home, Alfred wrote to me. So this is, we did a lot of teaching. We, um, I used to be, before I became a doctor, I was in the lab, and so I did a lot of talking to them about lab equipment, um, about quality control. We talked about um, phlebotomy and blood drawing, so I felt like it was a good um, give and take kind of experience. And then the most recent mission was to, uh, my most recent mission was to Indonesia, and again, completely new uh, kind of model. So our hosts, Father Chrysostom and Presbytera Elizabeth, um, they're native Indonesians, and um, they have, in Medan, Indonesia, they have founded two primary schools, which are Orthodox. Um, they founded a seminary, St. Paul Seminary. They have their church, St. Demetrios, and then they have the hospital, RSU Theotokos Hospital. So these are all things that these two people are running. They're amazing. So let me tell you a little bit, well, I'll tell you about the host, and I'll tell you about the hospital. This is their pictures. This is um, Father Chrysostom. This is Presbytera Elizabeth and her daughter Soteria. And there's Taxia in the back. This is Medan. Medan is a city. This was really the first time it had a medical mission in a big city. So, um, and it was a Muslim city. So that is um, when Father and Presbytera were trying to decide where they were going to set up their missions um, in Indonesia. They picked Medan because for a Muslim country, Med and Medan was a, a city that had a, a lot more um, tolerance of Christians. Don't love them, but they tolerate them. So this is the Indonesian medical dilemma. This is why we went. The government offers health insurance to everyone, so that makes it very um, possible to pay for the medical um, facilities. But a couple, years late, a couple years ago, a new government came in, and they decided that every facility needed to have um, credentials, which is great. I mean, that's good. You need to have credentials to, to make sure that things are going well. Unfortunately, in order for a facility to be credentialed, you have to have inspectors, and they have to meet certain criteria. And so when they started that, of course, they only had a few inspectors, so they made a priority. 
Government hospitals first, Muslim hospitals second, Christian hospitals third. And which would have been fine, except what they did is like starting today, you have to be credentialed and you're third on the list, you Christian hospitals. So essentially, the hospital went being, from being a fully functioning hospital to an empty hospital because they could no longer take insurance. Now, yeah, they could take private pay patients, but there's not a lot of private pay patients in Indonesia. So we have a well-equipped, now Father did make the decision to keep his staff on because he'd made that commitment to them, and of course they had families to feed, so he was paying staff every month for a hospital that wasn't functioning, but that was his commitment to his people. But nobody there. Fully ready, full operating room, beds, no patients. So what Father did is he invited the um, OCMC to send a medical mission team to do free clinics, to at least keep his people busy and to keep, keep people aware of the hospital as being a functioning place for healing. So he put this sign up that, it, that said that the team from America will be there um, May 16th to 18th, and that so people would know to come, and there was no, no cost to it. So in Indonesia, we had several um, missions. We had several clinics. The first clinic was at St. Sophia School. This was one of the schools that he has founded, and our first clinic um, was on the last day of school, so we would have had more clinics at the school if they'd been open longer. But there we, the, there we treated the teachers and the students. And then all the people in yellow, they're all the staff from the hospital. So they brought all the medicines over, they brought all the equipment over so that we could hold the clinic in the school. And then we had several clinics in the hospital itself. Um, Again, we worked, so, this is Soteria, their daughter. She had just graduated from medical school. Am I running late? Okay, I'll, I'll keep going. Um, she had just graduated from medical school, so, so she was helpful. And so, again, we worked next to native doctors. We did have a few inpatients. When we arrived, we had a, a baby that had been born by C-section, and so she had some TTN, transient tachypnea, newborn. So she did require some oxygen and a feeding tube. I mean, she did well, and she was gone by the time we left. And then a local pastor uh, was there for um, high blood pressure that was uncontrollable. So both those patients, father allowed to come into the hospital, um, and they were both charity patients. So we were able to, um, out of the money that people donated to us, to pay for both their hospital stays, so it didn't come out of father's pocket. We lurked along the, lo along the local caregivers. Uh, the woman here with a, a headdress on is a local emergency room doctor. Um, even though the hospital was closed, Father did not want to close the emergency room, so he had her on staff, um, very few patients. So when we were there, she was kind of, the first day she just kind of hung out. We really didn't know who she was. But then we found out that she was a physician. So even though she didn't speak English, we worked with the translator, and she helped us with um, a lot of the, of the patient care. This is Megan. She was a nurse. Um, one of the problems I'll, um, that I'll talk about later is that we just don't have enough caregivers on these medical mission teams. So when we do have them, sometimes we press them into um, jobs that they maybe don't do in the United States. So Me Megan saw patients right along with me. And so we sat next to each other and we talked about cases, but it was pretty, um, for her, it was, it was at first uncomfortable, but she really rose to the occasion and did a very, very good job. We had a lot of interesting patients. Um, this patient has um, cirrhosis of the liver. And we just worked together. Our final, um, med our, our final um, clinic was at the St. Paul's Seminary. Um, this is a seminary that the Father has that is for Christians, not necessarily for Orthodox Christians, because there just aren't enough Orthodox Christians. So it's mostly Protestants that come to the seminary. But Father makes no bones about this. This is an Orthodox seminary, and he teaches Orthodoxy. And he has had several people convert as a result of his teaching, but that's not his goal. His goal is just to support Christianity in a Muslim country. These are the students. They also had a dentist there that time, and it was a local dentist. And 
This is our, this is our clinic table, this lovely pink tablecloth. A lot of, you'll see here, I'm demonstrating how to use an inhaler. A lot of asthma because of the bad pollution in Medan. St. Demetrius was the church that Father founded. It was next door to the seminary, so we weren't able to go to church um, as often as we were in Tanzania, where it was right next to where we were staying. So in, in um, Indonesia, we had our own private morning prayers and evening prayers. I have a picture of the altar boys here because Father had asked um, Presbytera at the OCMC for some altar boy robes. And what you'll find when you go on a medical mission is that you just see tons of miracles. I mean, things just happen. And so about two weeks before the mission um, was set to leave, a church somewhere in the Midwest had changed altar boy robes, and they just sent them to the mission center to do with them what they could. They didn't know that Father in Indonesia had asked for them. So we were able to bring all these altar boy robes to um, Father and Presbytera, and they proudly wore them on the first day that we were there. Church was packed when we were there. The Orthodox that are there are very faithful, mostly women on the right, men on the left, but kind of we had to fill in with women because there weren't enough men. They had several songs planned for us. So this is, you can see, one of the songs that they had planned for us. They really, Father and Presbytera, really prepared for our visit, and that, that's part of what makes a really successful mission. We did have some time to, to have some playtime. Um, this is shopping in the open air market. And then one time after, while we were finishing up clinic, a couple of the um, team members went back with Presbytera to their home and made us some apple pie. And then the, the, the team that we had was a combination of caregivers and students. And so the students helped us some in clinic, but um, Presbytera invited the students to come to the seminary for a couple of days and do some teaching. And at first, everyone was a little nervous because they hadn't prepared any lessons. But they rose to the occasion and really um, felt like they really had a good time meeting the students and teaching. And I think that that was a really um, valuable part of the mission. So what are our medical frustrations when you do a medical mission? We treat in a window. We just have this, this short period of time. Lack of resources. Sometimes it's medical resources, sometimes it's personnel, lack of caregivers, that we just don't have enough people signing up for medical missions, and our medical limitations. We see things there that we just aren't familiar with, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. What do we do well? What do we feel good about with medical missions? We do well with diagnosing and treating, so we do feel like some, we do make a difference with some patients. Um, we do give, get help for those who are unable to treat. Um, there are, um, a lot of times, we'll, there's something that needs surgery. We can't do surgery. So when we go on a medical mission, in, a, in addition to people supporting us on the mission, a lot of times people will offer just money. You know, you know, can I give you $20? And I always say yes, because when we go on a mission, things come up. And if we have that money, then we can do things with it, like we could pay for the, um, the inpatient stay. And sometimes that money helps pay for getting people help um, that we can't provide. And we do teaching and support for the indigenous caregivers. So here are some things that we couldn't do anything about. This was a woman who had warts. Um, she had them all over her body. Um, we she'd already been tested to HIV negative. We really could not do anything about that. I was, I was very frustrated because she had come back two years in a row, and nobody was able to do anything for her. And I still remember her. This was a girl uh, who had been burned, probably in a fire, so she needed to be debrided, so we paid for her to take the, the taxi to go to the emergency room, and we paid for that emergency room visit and tried to give her a little extra in case she needed to be, well, she did need to be treated. This is a man who walked in to one of the field um, clinics. Um, I have no clue how he even walked on that foot, but... Again, nothing that we could do, but we had money, we pulled money, we sent him to the hospital and paid for surgery. This was a little girl who again had been burned. Again, all we could do is just send her to the hospital. But sometimes we could help them. 
Um, this is a picture of um, a man who, who came into the clinic at the seminary who had a boil under his arm. He had been lanced at a local clinic, but then they didn't do anything other than lance it, and it just came back. So we gowned up and got our scalpel, and we opened the, opened the boil, um, packed it, and then gave him antibiotics. This was the baby I talked about earlier who did get better and went home. This was a woman who came into Indonesia who had a goiter, and so we were able to get a TSH thyroid test on her, which was normal. So we, did set, we were able to set her up with an endocrinologist for further studies. This was a lady who came in with AFib. Um, we diagnosed it and treated her. So what do we, how have we made a difference? I've been on four short-term medical missions. I've gone in, I've treated a few patients, and I've come home. So why do I feel like I want to keep doing this? And it's because we are making a difference. In Uganda, I talked a little bit about Sue Nelson before. In Uganda, Sue Nelson and Father Joseph, who went on the mission, that very first Gulu mission, have really felt um, a call in their heart to do something about Uganda. And so they have actually, Father Joseph is fabulous at raising money. So he has raised money, and they've actually established a clinic um, in Gulu, in Okonibedo Village. Um, it's the St. Nectarios Clinic and it's fully functioning now. This is the priest um, blessing the clinic when it opens, and this is a picture of Father Joseph and Sue, and then the Father, jo um, uh, Father, yeah, and then Father George, whose village it was in, and the bishop. And their latest edition, they just got raised money for, you can see this is a motorcycle ambulance, so when patients have to go to the hospital, they have a way to transport them, and here they're blessing the ambulance. Uthufu Medical Center. <laughs> so that was also a success. That was long-term missionaries working together with um, the Greeks have established a fully functioning clinic with local, um, with local staff. Here's Giannis, his, his, he had his birthday while we were there. Um, so that is another place that there's continued care for the medical people in um, Bukoba, Tanzania. In Indonesia, while we were there, Father got his letter, and I tried to, to show how many pages of requirements there were for him to get credentialed for his hospital. But at least he got the letter, and now he could start working on, in fact, while we were there, he was already working on um, what he had to do to get the hospital credentialed. So what resources do we need? Well, of course, monetary. Um, there are so many needs overseas. We do what we can, but... Bukoba, the clinic in Bukoba is out of town. They would love to have a van so they could bring patients to the clinic. Um, in Indonesia, there's so much diabetes. I can't believe how much diabetes there is. So they need like a TSH, I mean, an A1C machine to test the A1Cs. They could use thyroid function machine. Um, the clinic in Gulu, we have a fully functioning clinic, but the income doesn't pay for the salaries. So again, monetary resources. Human resources. We need more caregivers willing to, to come, both for short-term and long-term. If anybody was interested in long-term, there's so many places that they could be use, useful. Um, most missions would benefit from a dentist. Dental problems are huge in all the countries we went to. We need medical specialists. Most of the time what we, we have are just the internal medicine, which is great. But I'd love to have a dermatologist because there's so many things I see that I just don't know what to, to make of. Pediatricians, surgeons. Um, if, we, if we had a specialist that was going, wherever they were going, the clinic, the, the, the host would make sure that they have cases that they could, they could do. And more volunteers. Um, you know, many, uh, there have been medical missions that have been canceled because there was no caregiver that signed up. So challenges, um, time. How can we as caregivers find the time, more time in our schedule to get back? I know we're all busy, and it's hard to find 10 or 12 days to take off and go on a medical mission, but we have so much. And I, I always challenge myself, could I really go on like a three-week mission? Could I give up my income for three weeks and go out there? And I, I, that's my challenge to myself. And what can we do to make a difference? And these are questions I don't have any answers for. 
what can we do to leave a lasting legacy? You know, as Orthodox Christians, we want to have our faith and we want to take care of our people. And medical missions or medicine is part of taking care of our people. And that's the ongoing challenge for the Orthodox Medical Mission Program. Thank you. <laughs> we have questions for Cheryl. Yes. So, uh, my one question, <clears throat> thank you for this. It was really interesting. It was illuminating. Um, do, you, do, you treat, um, do you treat all sorts of um, faiths and yes. backgrounds? Um, the, 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 all the missions that we went to, even though they're on church grounds, they're advertised to the community. So whoever comes, comes. And same with Father's, Father's Hospital and same with the clinic in, in Bukova. There's, there's no, we had in the Bukova, we know we had Muslims because they had their head yeah. So yeah, there's no, no discrimination. We make sure that they know this is Orthodox, but we don't discriminate who we treat. Great. Um, and is there any sort of, it seems that it's moral, like a, bioethical mission in that sense, um, which I like, yeah. um, that it's like a medical moral mission, um, not a proselytizing sort of. It's not, and, that, and that's the, one of the things that we've always kind of, kind of struggled with, because, you know, again, um, we want to make sure that we do as much as we can with every mission, yeah. we have such an opportunity. But because uh, we really feel like our, our witness is our, our medical treatment, not talking. Uh, if somebody asked, of course, uh, and that was nice when, when the priest was there because he could work with the priest, but again, not proselytizing. No, and I think yeah. that's, uh, they're, that's they're, great. Their presence there is proselytizing. Yeah. <laughs> they know they're Orthodox doctors in America. Yeah, and they know we're doing this well, for free. They give it themselves. They're, they're, they're evangelizing by giving on the, yes. of themselves. Yes. I think that's a systemic problem with proselytizing, right. right? And that's why I think this is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Shall sure. we say something? So, What's that? Absolutely, James. Yeah, please. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Chad, I wanted to add to what Cheryl said as someone who was on the ground hosting that this is also now a ministry of these parishes to their communities. And, you know, if you can imagine a community that has no access to hardly any medical treatment, and now the local church brings in doctors from overseas, can you imagine then saying, now all the orphans, like what, what kind of conflicts that would create in oh, the local course, community. Yeah. Where on the other hand, it's often seen as, you know, this church now has brought this gift in, and that's an ongoing ministry of the parish, then the fact that they've brought a clinic in that has helped people is now outreach. Gail, you had something. Yeah, I have a question. Cheryl, if you could have an ideal dream team um, to go on a mission trip, who who would it consist of? How many? I, I know it would differ, differ probably from one country to another, but I mean, what, you know, what about Indonesia? So just Indonesia, what would be your perfect team? Well, because we have a hospital in Indonesia, um, we, and, 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 you know, the team is always, you know, a big team is more difficult than a small yeah, team. Yeah, that's right. So, Probably they say that ideal team is probably between six and eight. And in, if in Indonesia, we'd love to have a surgeon. We have a functioning surgical um, ward, so it'd be great if a surgeon could come. They would plan the surgeries. Like I say, I'd love to have a dermatologist. Um, probably two um, physicians, working physicians, and maybe two nurses. Um, in, uh, Indonesia's a little different because they already have nurses hired. So we don't need as many nurses as we would say on a team where we actually went out to the bush. But it's, it's the doctors and the care. And, and I say doctors. It could be PAs. It could be nurse practitioners. It, it doesn't have to be a physician. But yeah, so that's what an ideal team would be. Well, I'm just asking so you can yeah. think about recruitment. Yeah. Michael? So um, the VA, Department of Defense, they use CVT, clinical video telemedicine, to get work done. And I'm thinking that dermatology would be an ideal place for that, a volunteer here in the States who could take images that you could shoot over. But it's not just dermatology. There are a lot of other specialties. And I'm wondering whether even having a pediatrician on backup to help you with some of that stuff, yeah. you know, if you have an internist going, say, you've, you've, you're trained in both, but right, right. Others, others may not have that. And so on and so forth. I, I can think of a number of. And even, we do even in primary care. So I'm, I'm thinking, wow, you can have uh, mid levels or, or nurses trained in 
how to use to use the uh, equipment and 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 get uh, consultation from stateside. Well, I don't know how we set up that. Up You'd have to find these interns somehow. You know how you set this up. You have a permanent group yeah, exactly. down at the mission center or somewhere, which are looking at these things. And we can't do everything. Now let's say we have these three, four countries. Let's concentrate on them, yeah. see what their needs are, send people on a more regular basis. People will go, but they can't go in chaotic situations. No. And they shouldn't have to, you shouldn't have to go and start ABCs. Right. You should be able to go and have your clinic there, your staff there, your facilities. She's not there now. She's not there. Sad, but that was the frustrating part about Maria and Felice going, is that that's exactly what they were going for. They were going for long-term medical missions, and the clinic wasn't open. Yeah, she was, the clinic was, she was still there not. Two years. If it wasn't for her, they wouldn't have built. Exactly. I mean, clinic. she got the clinic open. I mean, she did. She did accomplish a huge task. But then when she got, went to practice, she had it would, her two years were up. However, so. she has finished her training. In midwife, nurse midwife, and yeah. Plan again to go back. Right. Well, she's going to go back to the mission field. Whether God calls her to Bukoba, Tanzania, she doesn't know yet. Yeah. So we need a long-term solution to this. Absolutely. Cheryl has been wonderful with her shared. We send medical teams out every year, usually four to five. They all come back with similar stories. And what we're doing is piecemeal. So those of you that are interested, we're meeting at 9 o'clock tonight at the Hilton Hotel to start talking about a long-term, is that okay, by the way, Jim? Cliff, Chris, whoever would like to meet with us in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel. Any more questions here? Yes, yeah, stand up. Teammates on the Indonesian. I just didn't know if she wanted to share anything. You want to say something? Um, so Indonesia was the second um, mission trip I had been on. It's the first healthcare one I had been to Project Mexico as well. Um, but I think Indonesia was a really unique situation too, where Father Chrysostom and Chrysostom Elizabeth had really they were like indigenous missionaries in their own work and what the two of them have done, like Dr. Cheryl said, is like amazing. They're literally living saints because like any two normal people couldn't accomplish everything they've done. Um, but I think too, the most important part of missions, especially in the healthcare field and for them was just to show support from other parts of the world. Um, Indonesia is basically an all Muslim country Medan, there were, it is like 50% Christians, but that's a very isolated part of the country. Um, so just showing them support from other parts of the world, like recognizing their efforts and saying that we want to continue to help them, um, I think is just a huge part of the missions too, just showing that they're not alone. Orthodoxy is not just something that they think about in other parts of the world. Um, so that is what I took away mostly from the mission. Very, very nice. God bless you. Any other comments, anyone? Cheryl? Cheryl? Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you for Beautiful. Thank you.